Welcome. Uh, this is the first of three parts of the Congressional Western Caucus series we're calling Biden's Executive Disorder, an Attack on American Energy. I'm Dan Newhouse, and I proudly serve the fourth district of the great state of Washington. And I'm also uh, proud to be serving as the chairman of the Congressional Western Caucus. This morning, I'm delighted to welcome two very esteemed members of, of the caucus and of Congress, Vice Chair Chris Stewart of the great state of Utah, and our new member, Representative Yvette Harrell of the great state of New Mexico for part one of this series entitled Devastating Rural Communities. This series is intended to look at the grave consequences of President Biden's executive actions, including his moratorium on oil and gas leasing on federal lands, as well as the cancellation of the Keystone XL pipeline, something that we are calling the Biden ban. Now I've said it many times and I'm gonna to continue to say, it is simply unconscionable that President Biden would, in the middle of a global pandemic that has wreaked havoc on our local communities, gut the state, local, and education budgets in many Western states, devastate our nation's energy sector and our ability to serve American energy independence, eliminate thousands of jobs, and prevent the creation of many thousands more. All of that with a simple flick of his pen. Now, could you imagine had President Trump signed such an order in the middle of a pandemic? I think it would be a national outrage. And today, our focus is on the rural communities who are gonna be further devastated by these executive actions. This morning, we're gonna be hearing from representatives of schools, lands, local governments in the great states of Utah and New Mexico regarding the impacts of these federal decisions on their communities. I sincerely feel the president acted without input or meaningful debate from the members of Congress, nor from the local communities who would be most affected by the Biden ban. So with these hearings, Congressional Western Caucus is working to ensure that our collective voices are heard. Again, I'm delighted to have the good vice chairman with us representing the great state of Utah, a friend and a fellow member of the Appropriations Committee. So Mr. Stewart, the floor is yours for your opening statement. Now please unmute your, your microphone, Chris, thank you. There we go. Dan, good morning. Uh, thank you for hosting us and putting this together. You do such a great job as the chairman of the Western Caucus. Yvette, thank you for joining us. We, we look forward to working with you as well. And uh, there's so much we have in common between Utah and the great state New Mexico that you represent. Uh, I'll be have a chance in a little bit to introduce uh, some of the guests that we have with us, the panelists, experts, people who have been impacted and care deeply about the issues that we're going to talk about today. And Mike and David, again, thank you for joining us. As we were kind of chatting before, it is early out in Utah, uh, but we're, we're thankful you're willing to, uh, to get up and join us this morning. Look, executive orders is something that I think most of us find deeply offensive, regardless of what the order might be, but for the reason that we're taking the power that should reside in the legislature, in the Congress, and we're deferring that to, as you said, Dan, to one man or one woman, to one person, the power of the presidency, who can then say, you know, I kind of want to be a king. I don't want to be just a president. I'm going to go big. And that's absolutely what President Biden has done. He has gone enormously big. He's gone aggressively, radically big in his executive orders. I mean, it's hilarious that he, he made uh, reference to, you know, President Trump. Uh, as if he were uh, leading as if he were a, uh, you know, Hitler. And he had five executive orders in the time that President Biden has done more than 52. And no one has been more impacted that, by that than have those citizens, those Americans in the Western states. Uh, as he has claimed this power that should reside in Congress because we are closer to the people. If Dan and I 
make a decision that harms our states or harms our constituents, they can vote us out of office. But they have no, they have no recourse when the president does this. It's four long years. And many times the people in California or in New York will make the decision to keep him regardless of what happens to the people in Utah. And, you know, there's this, just this reality that no one who had a good job on the night of the election, whether it's working in oil or mining or harvesting timber, which is important in Dan's, in Dan's state and, and his district, or grazing, which is important in my state. If you were making a living in one of those industries and you went to bed on election night thinking, well, I'll have a job in the morning. And then you wake up and you had to wonder because a whole bunch of guys didn't have a job or were soon not going to have a job. And Chairman Newhouse, you mentioned, you know, the Keystone Pipeline. That's a great example of that. 11,000 great jobs, most of them union, that have gone away and tens of thousands of support jobs that we don't even think about, we don't even count, that we're supporting that pipeline that have gone, gone away as well. Again, in the Western states, we're particularly vulnerable to this. We, we have to beg the president, please don't do this to us. And, and I'll conclude by this final remark. It's easy for President Biden to do this because he doesn't care about Utah. I mean, so far as I know, the only time he's ever come to my state was to Park City to raise money. He, he's not going to come out to Utah and, and talk to the people in the western or eastern parts of the state who are really impacted by this. He knows he doesn't need their vote to win re-election. He, he's not the one that he's been, or they're not the one he's been pandering to or that he'll continue to pander to. He doesn't care about Utah. He'll never come to Utah. He's making decisions that have enormous impacts on the people in my state and the people in my district. And that's the reason that we're holding this, this hearing today. So Chairman, again, thank you for all of the participants. We look forward to hearing from you. And, uh, and I look forward to introducing my friends from Utah. Thank you so much, Chris, appreciate that. And uh, now I'd like to turn to our representative from New Mexico's second district, someone who's proving to be a really strong leader speaking out on behalf of her constituents who truly are at the epicenter of these issues that we're talking about uh, this morning. Uh, so Representative Yvette Perrell, uh, please uh, uh, give you the floor for your opening comments. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman Newhouse. And really just to echo what Chris says, these executive orders, I think when we saw a new president come into the office uh, of the administration, we expected change, but to the extent and the speed in which we're seeing these changes take place are very harmful, not only to our economies, but also to our, our workforce. And I've written some notes because I'm going to kind of peel a little further back as this uh, as this executive order as it relates to ban the the banning the leasing on uh, federal lands what it means to New Mexico specific um, and I'm doing that because as Chris stated the Western states are unique in that we have more federal lands than any other states west of Colorado or east of Colorado so this is a real challenge for us uh, we have unique sets of challenges but um, it. it it's important though that we get the message out and we get the truth out so uh, people can understand what we're facing. In New Mexico, over half of the oil production and two thirds of the uh, natural gas production comes off of public lands. This production employs nearly 120,000 people statewide and estimates show right now that a ban on new oil and gas leases could cost the state of New Mexico over 60,000 jobs by the end of next year. The royalty payments and taxes from oil and gas industry contribute more than a third of our state's general fund. The loss in revenue from President Biden's leasing ban will have the greatest impact on the children of New Mexico as over one billion, and that's B, one billion dollars from oil and gas industry goes to the New Mexico public schools every year. And before the ban was announced, we actually sent a letter to our governor, Michelle Lujan Grisham, asking her how she would make up that lost revenue, how we would keep these schools um, staffed, how we would keep the revenues going into the classroom for our children. That was uh, a letter we sent in January and we have yet to receive a reply from our governor. 
But after the announcement, I introduced the Power Act, which right now has over 50 sponsors. And this bill basically presents the president from halting new oil and gas leases on federal land, but it also protects coal, hard rock, uh, minerals, critical minerals, and other leasing on federal, um, federal lands without the consent of Congress. And for too long, and I think Chris can agree with this, you know, Cong we've conceded authority to the public lands to uh, the executive branch. And this bill will actually help us protect and take back control of the decisions that affect so many people. I've also introduced a bill to protect our jobs in New Mexico called the Protecting New Mexico Jobs and Public Education System Act, which would actually exempt New Mexico from these harmful executive orders. But my state would be the most negatively affected in the nation on the leasing ban because more than half of the onshore oil produ production on federal lands is in the state of New Mexico. And in response to a lot of questions that have come up and concerns that, uh, you know, my, my colleagues have raised regarding the potential loss in oil and gas jobs, the Biden administration has said that people can just go find work elsewhere. Well, Mr. Chairman, that answer is not good enough for the people of New Mexico or the Western states or the unions that have been laid off as a result of these executive orders. In fact, stats show that workers involved in oil and gas on an average make $48 an hour compared to $39 an hour in wind and compared to $21 an hour in installation of solar panels. So quite clearly you can see that there is an economic disadvantage for us just sending people out the door to find more jobs in a different industry. But we also know that the green energy will not backfill the potential 120,000 jobs that we could lose in New Mexico. So I really look forward you know, to continuing working with my Western Caucus friends to finding real solutions that work for the people of not only New Mexico, but America the American worker, the American business owner. There is so much uncertainty right now coming from this executive branch that we must stand together and continue to educate our constituents. And, and Chris is right. We were sent here by the people that believed in our ability to take their voices to Washington, DC. And right now that's very compromised by the executive orders. And I, I really am excited to be standing strong and filling in the gap right now so that we can protect this important industry and these important jobs. And Mr. Chairman, I thank you again for, for hosting this um, and allowing us to bring some amazing guests to the panel today and have a deeper discussion about how this impacts our schools and our uh, economy. Uh, thank you so much, Representative Harrell. Great comments. And it truly brings to light the real live impacts that this, this, these decisions will have. Um, I'd like to invite Mr. Stewart to um, introduce our first, our first panelist uh, from the great state of Utah. But before he begins, just let me remind everyone, all of our speakers to unmute uh, themselves when it's time to speak and then please mute yourself again after you're complete. But Mr. Stewart, please uh, uh, introduce our first panelist. Okay, um, but before I introduce Mike, I, I have to comment just very quickly on what one thing that Ms. Harrell said, uh, Congresswoman Harrell, and that is uh, the importance of oil and natural gas to her and to her state. Uh, she had some pretty remarkable statistics in there. But if any of you had the chance to watch the, the Senate hearings on the nominee for the Secretary of Interior and, and her apparent uh, almost obliviousness to the importance of oil and gas. And I mean, unable to answer the most simple questions about pipelines, the importance of pipelines, about tribes who would lose 90% of the revenue if the pipeline was shut down. And well, and her answer in many of these cases, well, we should legalize marijuana and tax that. I mean, it, it, it appeared she was not only uncaring, but unknowing about the importance of these issues to Western states. And it was, it was pretty remarkable to me. And it, I think it's a great indicator of the things that we're up against. And, and the first guest the panelist I'd like to introduce, I think understands that as well as perhaps anyone in the country. He is certainly aware. He certainly understands and has deep background and knowledge on this. And it's an honor to introduce Mike McKee. He's a county commissioner from UNT Utah. Uh, I believe he was a commissioner for 14 years. Uh, he was the executive director of the Seven County Infrastructure Coalition in Price, which its entire purpose was to deal with these kind of issues. He spent his entire life in the Unibasis, in the Unibasin. He has seen the ups and downs of the, uh, of the economic cycles as we've moved through, you know, strong times in energy and then times that were uh, 
a little more challenging. And that gives him and makes him qualified to speak on these Fed regulations and what it means to, you know, the daily life of people who live here and, and, and depend on it. So, uh, Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, uh, Congressman Stewart. Uh, thank you for that very kind introduction. And good morning, Chairman Newhouse and Representative Harrell. Uh, this is a great passion that we have out in the area where I live because 60% uh, of the economy in the Uinta Basin is tied to the extractive industry and 50% of our jobs. That came from a University of Utah study several years ago. But again, my name is Michael McKee and uh, I, I really appreciate uh, this opportunity because this is such an important issue. And thank you to your committee for, for, for listening to these issues. Uh, President Biden's recent executive orders threaten our economy, economy, limits our future investments and devastates hardworking Utahs and their families. The land mass that I represent in the seven counties in Utah, uh, we're only comprised of 15% private land and most of, most of that land mass is federal land. And so again, these policies immensely affect what happens here. But regulations, executive orders on federal lands have a tremendous impact on our communities and its citizens. Most of the oil and gas and coal that come uh, in Utah comes from the counties that I represent. The executive orders that target the nation and, and specifically the state of Utah's mineral development sectors have the ability to rip the heartbeat from our local communities. Placing a freeze on all new oil and gas and coal leasing on federal lands puts Eastern and Central Utah's economy at stake. Drilling and mining activities on these federal lands are a significant source of revenue for our communities and our families, as I mentioned about the University of Utah study. Many other jobs will not be viable without the economic base of the extractive industry. As you know, the extractive industry pays a 12.5% royalty to the federal government for leasing and the production that comes from our federal lands. Then 49% of that royalty is returned to the state from which it was generated. From 2006 to 2020, which is a 15 year span, there were nearly $2 billion that were returned to the state of Utah from these mineral lease funds. In Utah, these funds are used in our communities to help our communities that have, uh, it's just been such a blessing to us in, in rural Utah. These funds have been used for planning, various infrastructure projects, including roads and bridges, recreation and community centers, water and sewer systems, jails, fire protections. These, these fire stations have station trucks, uh, training. Uh, also, it's been used for emergency ser services and many other aspects that we've been able to use these uh, mineral lease funds. And again, these, these funds only come from leasing on federal lands. If, if we don't have leasing on our federal lands, then these uh, funds go away. Without these funds, our communities would be a very different place than they are today. When building an economy, we need to utilize the resources that we have. Natural resources are what we have in the area where I am at and vast amounts of it. This includes clean natural gas, high quality coal, and low sulfur oil. The loss of mineral lease funds is very significant. However, it is small compared to the total cost, which includes capital investment, direct labor force, supporting jobs, etc. Additionally, the economic impacts of this decision could not have come at a worse time for, our, for Utah. Our energy industry was among the hardest hit by COVID-19 pa uh, pandemic. Just as we were positioned to begin to recover from the ripple effects of the pandemic, the decision to implement these executive orders has the potential to only shatter our communities. We, the Seven County Coalition, recently submitted a letter to President Biden alongside our governor and legislators asking that he revoke the recent executive orders as they pertain to Utah and table any plans to permanently ban oil and gas leasing on federal lands. Taking such, such actions would signal a willingness to unify the nation, work across party lines to better manage our public lands and support all hardworking Utahns, which during a global pandemic is more important than ever. Thank you very much for this opportunity. We appreciate uh, what you are all trying to do and we cannot thank you enough from the areas that I come from 
for any work and all work that you're doing to try and help us with this very important issue. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Ricky. I appreciate very much your comments and we're happy to help elevate your voice. So thank you for participating this morning. Uh, Mr. Stewart, uh, would you be good enough to introduce our second panelist from the Beehive State? Of course, I would love to, be proud to. Uh, David, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, <clears throat> David, if you ever wake up depressed because you got to go out and work the cows, call me and I will tell you how jealous I am of the, how you're going to spend your day versus how I'm going to spend mine. Uh, I grew up farming and ranching and I miss it dearly. And, uh, and I really am jealous and envious of, of the life that you, you live in many ways. But the point of this, of this hearing is to help you continue to, to preserve that lifestyle. Uh, David is, a, is, as I said, a farmer rancher from Summit County, which is one of the most beautiful places in the entire, in the entire United States, certainly one of the most beautiful places in, in Utah. He was named, this is kind of cool, he was named Summit County's <clears throat> Rancher of the Year, uh, which is uh, indeed a high honor, especially out west. He served as a, as a representative to Utah State Legislature for more than a decade. <clears throat> and he serves now in a very, very important capacity as executive director of the State uh, of Utah's uh, School and Institutional Trust Land, SITLA, we call it, which is enormously important in the state. Uh, give you a sense of, of their responsibilities and, and David's responsibilities. SITLA administers roughly 4.5 million acres of uh, mineral estates, 3.5 million acres in other uh, revenue generating uh, parts of our state. They generate between 100 and $150 million of revenue uh, to the permanent trust fund that is used for our schools. As has been mentioned here already. So again, David, uh, thank you for being with us. Thanks for your service, the important role that you play. Uh, welcome, and we look forward to hearing you. Thank you, Congressman. I might add, before I came down here to work this morning, <clears throat> I helped two, two black Angus cows have their calves this morning. That was about 3.30. Um, that's, as I always say, I got to go home and do my honest work uh, because you don't take advantage of Mother Nature you get what you put into it. And, uh, and so I, uh, <clears throat> I love agriculture. <clears throat> and the family farm. So enough of that, let's go to work. Um, I'm in my fifth year, starting my sixth year in, in the, as the director of trust lands here. And before we get into really what the governor or what the president has done to us here in Utah. I need to explain to you a little bit about the setup of SITLA. As I show you a map right here, I think you can see it up here. You see all, I call it the measles disease. And all the blue specks you see in there are lands that we own on scattered sections. When we came into the nation in uh, 1896, through the enabling clause, we were given four sections in every township. Two, uh, 16, 32, and 36. So we're scattered across the entire state of Utah. And we have to access our land 90% uh, of the time through federal land. And what, let me explain to you a little bit about the money that we, that we generate. If you will ask any school teacher in the state of Utah, they will say the most important money that they receive is our SITLA money because we bypass the legislature, we bypass the state school board, we bypass the local school board, and we go directly to each individual school building. Now there's a, there's a, a set amount of money that just says, if you have a building, we give you $100,000 or what might be, but after that, that's on a per capita basis. But the decisions of how that money is spent is made by the principal, two teachers, and three parents. And so they, they go directly to whatever the school needs. So it might be textbooks this year or computers, or they've even set up suicide prevention programs in some schools in Highland High School here, <clears throat> which I know personally, has kept, 
least four students over the last year from committing suicide. <clears throat> How do you put a value on that? <laughs> I don't know. <clears throat> but in Utah here, 66% of our land is, is, a federal, uh, is a federally owned. Not only does that stop though, by him putting a, a moratorium on these leases, not only does that stop the, the growth of oil and gas revenues in the, uh, federal lands, but because of the pooling or the unitizing that we have here in the state of Utah or across the nation, you and New Mexico have exactly the same thing, is that I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna show you a map here, what I, wanna, what I want to show you in this little spacing here that gives you exactly what I'm trying to talk about. Um, maybe I'm gonna show you. Um, are you seeing it over here on, on your, on your, the map up there? We do, yes, we do, okay. David. Okay, if you will look, if you will look over um, right here where my monitor is, that's a pooling area or a unitizing area. And the revenues are shared in that off the federal leases and also on our leases together and pooled together to where we, we share the revenues collaboratively with each other. Uh, you can see all, all these other areas right through here where there's a dark line around them. They're all pooling units also. But if you look down through here or over through this area over here where there haven't been pooling agreements put in place yet, by the president stopping us from uh, leasing in there, that's also then going to make uh, make our land stranded also. So it's it's not just the federal lands that is affected; it's our school children's lands, and we have to work very closely with the BLM and and also private oil companies to make sure that we're being fair with everybody. That there's a percentage of the land versus a percentage of the oil, and it's, there's lots of different ways of of figuring it out. I won't give you that. I'm a dairy farmer. I'm not a mathematician of how that works. But also let me tell you this, that say, say we, um, as you all know, you don't bring the oil to the hole, you take the hole to the oil. And if the a police, uh, right there on that one right there, if they drill a hole probably within two miles of our borders, and with the hor uh, horizontal drilling anymore, which goes out two miles or mile and a half to two miles. And then do we go on to federal land? Are we gonna be stopped from going on to federal land even though we're not physically on it? On the surface, we're going down a mile and a half or two miles and then going horizontal. What's that gonna do to us? These, all these questions, we don't know how it's gonna affect us. Um, off any one of those oil pads, you can have three or four different di di uh, uh, horizontal directions going off from it. I will also say this, at least in Utah, I don't know if it'll affect New Mexico as much as it will Utah, but if the president puts an executive order in place to stop all fracking on federal lands, you might as well take the oil and gas industry off of Utah and just go put it in the Pacific Ocean we already have a high enough expense of, of putting a hole in the ground and bringing oil out, even though the oil is of a higher caliber, um, it's more expensive to get it here. And the, the, the use of the fracking mechanism has probably quadrupled the amount of oil that we bring into the state of Utah. And so I'm hoping the executive orders will stop because if he takes on fracking, we are DOA out here in Utah we will not be able to survive. We will not be able to entice people to invest in here. Now, also let me, let's talk about investing. I believe after talking for the last four or five days with different oil companies, that the, the issue of making these leasing programs or putting a band on leasing on federal lands is not only a physical detrimental to us, but I believe that they truly believe that if they really wanna stop the, the mining or the, the drilling of hydrocarbons, what we have to do is to stop, the, is stop the investing dollars going into it. Less than a week ago, George or Bill Gates said, I wanna start my second billion dollars of collecting investors money and starting renewable energy uh, programs. Let's stop and think about Mr. John Q. Public. 
if he knows that he's going to invest a million or 200,000 or whatever it might be in the oil industry, why is he going to want to do it? If he realizes that if he gets a lease and then he has to apply for an APD or an applied permit to drill, and that is stalled out for six months, a year, 18 months, why is that Mr. John Q. Public going to want to invest in hydrocarbons? He's going to go somewhere else. And so he will, even though the president says, well, we're still, we're still passing on APDs and we're still giving leases, he will mentally affect the ability of people wanting to invest in the, in the, the hydrocarbons because they're not sure if they'll ever get their money back, if it'll be stranded. And so he will starve us to death on both ends. Um, it's, it's, it's a mind game as much as it is a physical game. Right now, out in, out in Una Basin, where Mike lives, they're still, um, they are still signing off on the APDs or the applied permit uh, drills, but that's only because the oil companies were smart enough to put leases in place that they might need for two or three years in advance. But once we run out of those leases that these oil companies have, have put on storage, I think to get a lease, or even if you do get a lease, it will be 18 months or longer because everything's going to have to go to Washington in order to be signed off on an APD. Um, it's, I think about, I think about smartness in this area right here. And even if they don't stop the investment in these, in these programs, these programs are going to go to South America or Central America or whatever else they're going to go. And we will not have that domestic supply of power here in the United States. One more thing I'd like to bring up. Back in 2018, the Secretary of the Interior declared that uh, helium was a, a uh, what's the term for it? A um, critical mineral. Well, very few of the wells you drill for helium are directly, as, are directly for helium. And we all know that helium is very important in, in refrigeration for vaccines, uh, for um, uh, aerospace, for um, lots of other things. Let's see, uh, national security. <clears throat> Helium is a byproduct for the most part of natural gas. If we cannot produce the natural gas for the most part, probably 80% of our helium will not be in place because a pure helium well is far, few and far between. But even to drill for a pure helium well, you have to go for an oil or a gas permit. You don't just go for a helium permit itself. You have to have the oil and gas first and then apply for the helium permit. Helium it's starting to become a big issue in the state of Utah. We have probably three or four applications before Sittler right now to drill on our lands for helium. Helium will trade almost 100%, 100 times more than will natural gas. So it is a big money maker for us. All these things will go into effect or already things will, are, are in effect and they're not realizing unintended consequences both to our national defense and everything else. So, Mr. Chairman, I will get off my rant. I had a glass of milk this morning to calm me down before I got here. So, but I would like to, any, when you get through with this, I'll, I'll take any questions I can. Uh, okay. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you. And thank thanks you. for putting this thing together for us. Thank you, David. That was, that was awesome. It give, really gives a human face as well as an economic impacts to some of these decisions. So thank you for that. And, 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 and I hope that too, uh, uh, Burst this morning were, were were successful. They were <laughs> okay. Good. good. Uh, Ms. Harrell, I'd love to turn to you now to introduce our next uh, panelist from the great state of New Mexico. Please. I sure will. Thank you, Chairman Newhouse. And just really quick, uh, something Mr. McKee said a moment ago that just kind of I think helps put this in perspective. He mentioned about the. Uh, limited land mass they have for taxes. And for, for instance, the county that I come from has 60,000 residents, but only 12% of our land in Otero County is taxable. And I, I know these county commissioners get it because it just gives them not enough uh, to work with. But with that being said, I want to introduce um, a, a very dear friend of mine, a very important uh, role model and 
a member of the Lee County Commission. She's the board. Uh, Rebecca Long has been in the uh, southeastern corner of New Mexico uh, for decades, and she really is um, living the heartbeat of New Mexico and the oil and gas industry and what it means to New Mexico and how these producers, how this affects our communities, our towns, our industries. Um, and I really wanna thank Commissioner Long for joining us this morning. And I'd like to yield my time to her so that she can give us an update on what this looks like through the eyes of a commissioner in New Mexico. Don't forget to unmute, thank you. There we go, okay. So good, good morning. Thank you, uh, Representative Harrell. I appreciate you inviting me to this today. And a good morning to Chairman Newhouse and the other Western Caucus members as well. As she stated, my name is Rebecca Long. I'm the chair of the Lee County Commissioners in Lee County, New Mexico. I'm also the past president of New Mexico counties, and I'm also a current board member on the executive board there as well. You know, I really appreciate the uh, opportunity to share the concerns of my community. Um, when we became aware that President Biden issued executive orders placing a moratorium on oil and gas leases on federal land, my rural community became gravely concerned, not just for our area, but for all of New Mexico. As Representative Harrell already stated, um, you know, 60% of gas and 50% of oil production in New Mexico is on federal land. Oil and gas contributed 2.8 billion to New Mexico's economy in fiscal year 2020. And this accounts for 33 and a half percent of the total state spending for a year. Um, you know, we, we stand to lose 60 to 100,000 100, jobs if this moratorium happens, 1 billion in state spending and 1 billion in school funding as well. And now I wanna to talk to you about uh, Lee County where I'm from. We have 71,000 awesome individuals in Lee County and oil and gas supports over 18,000 jobs with a labor income of $1.3 billion. Lee County is the number, is it, we're in the Permian Basin and we have been the number one producer of oil in the whole United States since December of 2019. We ha also have 40 megawatt of solar and 50 megawatt of wind energy in Lee County. We have the only uranium enrichment facility in the United States. We also have a county owned airport with flights to Houston. And we're hoping to open back up our flights to Denver soon as well. We have 844 teachers in 37 schools in Lee County. The oil and gas industry provides 46 million a year to fund our K through 12 schools. And it also provides 2.2 million a year to fund our higher education. 50% of natural gas and 53% of oil production in Lee County is on federal land. Our, um, our Lee County revenue, the revenue to the county from oil and gas was 41 million in the 11 months of December 19 to November of 2020. Our current property uh, revenue, property tax revenue is 24 million a year. And we have 372 employees in Lee County with a $31 million payroll. Now what's gonna happen if this moratorium stands? What's gonna happen in Lee County specifically? Well, obviously with um, over 50% of our uh, production being on federal land, it's gonna have a huge impact. Our schools and public hospitals um, and five municipalities, they all have a collective long-term debt of $200 million. The majority of this debt is paid from revenues by the oil and gas tax. If this moratorium on federal leases continues, the oil companies can simply move a few miles away to Texas. And if this happens, GRT will plummet, residents will move, property values will sharply decline and property tax will dramatically decrease, making it probable that these entities will be unable to, unable to pay their debts. Lee County currently has no debt. We're very thankful for that with our county, but with 53% of oil production on federal land, our $41 million revenue will drop to 19 million. And of course our 24 million property tax will greatly decrease as well. 
We're gonna be forced to lay off county employees. Our roads will fall into disrepair. Our environmental road, DWI, and facility maintenance departments, along with our sheriff's department, will be understaffed and ineffective. Schools will be greatly underfunded. There'll be a shortage of doctors, nurses, hospital staff. You know, private small businesses like restaurant, clothing stores, mechanic shops, furniture stores, auto dealers, we all depend on these oil and gas workers to be buying these products and services. You know, the, the ripple effect of this will be massive and will cause high, high unemployment in Lee County. We have, four, we have folks already on unemployment from the pandemic shutdown and the drop in oil prices from last year. With the COVID vaccine, schools are reopening, our, count, our country is starting to move about, oil prices are rebounding, and we're hoping these oil and gas workers will find jobs again as rehiring starts here in Lee County. You know, these oil field jobs are high paying jobs, and these workers cannot just go out and find another job. An oil field truck driver here can make 80 to 100,000 or more a year with no college degree. Per ZipRecruiter, a renewable energy tech and a solar tech, they make anywhere from 35,000 to 60,000 a year. So there's, you know, they just, they can't just go out and find another job in another industry paying what they, they make now. And another thing is even if these oil and gas workers took the time to go to college and get a degree, isn't it unlikely that they're gonna walk off that campus holding a diploma in their hand and step right into another high paying job like the one that was just taken away from them? You know, for folks here in Lee County are nervous. We are dependent on oil and gas. And you know, we don't have rivers, lakes, mountains. We don't have large manufacturing plants, but God blessed us with oil and gas here. And this is what drives our economy. You know, this industry has well-paying jobs for hardworking men and women on a pay scale they won't find anywhere else. We know this to be true because people come from all over the U.S. here for these specific jobs. Our hardworking men and women here, they don't want to be on unemployment and they don't want to be in food pantry lines. They want to get up every day and go to work. They are proud of the contribution to America that they make to American energy independence because they understand that this leads to lower prices at the gas pump and at the grocery store for all Americans. And for all Americans, lower prices on everyday items like aspirin, shampoo, trash bags, cell phones, clothing, tires, and so on. Another th point that we have got to remember, and I know you all understand this, high energy costs hurt low income households on a larger scale, and we must be mindful of them. So um, I appreciate the time today to share just some of the, the facts and uh, some of the devastation that will happen in my county. You know, in Lee County, we're standing by and we're standing ready to do our part to support America. And we greatly appreciate your help today and, and your time today. And um, Chairman Newhouse and Western Caucus members and um, Yvette, Representative Harrell, I appreciate you so much and uh, I appreciate your time today. Awesome, Commissioner Long. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, Congresswoman Harrell, could I turn to you to introduce our, our final panelist for the day from the great state of New Mexico? Thank you. Yes, sir. It is my pleasure. And, you know, New Mexico is large in landmass, but uh, very close in people. And Mike Chavez is another great friend. Um, and I think what I really kind of want to preface all of this with is, and I think Mr. York kind of touched on this, really at the end of the day, we're talking about the, the uh, executive orders, we're talking about these natural resources, but let's just think about it for a moment. The most precious resource we have that we must protect is our children. And so, um, uh, I want to tell you that Mike uh, Chavez is the superintendent of the Hatch Valley Schools. The schools obviously are an integral part of the importance of oil and gas industry in New Mexico. And again, the royalties paid by oil and gas producers contribute over a billion dollars to the New Mexico public school system. And I really just want to thank Superintendent Chavez, my friend, uh, for participating today. And, and I'll yield over to him and let him give kind of a, a, a view of what inside the school, this is going to look like and how these uh, executive orders are going to impact. And again, this is someone who 
who is connected to our most valuable resource in our nation. And so with that, um, uh, Mr. Chavez, if you'd like to take the floor, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, uh, Representative Harrell. Um, Chairman Newhouse and members of the caucus, my name is Michael Chavez. I am the superintendent of Hatch Valley Public Schools located in Hatch, New Mexico, the chili capital of the world. Um, Hatch is located in Northern Doniana County in South Central New Mexico along the Rio Grande Valley. And I'm honored to be here to paint a picture on the impact the executive orders would have on hardworking people in small rural communities such as Hatch, New Mexico. Just want to piggyback a lot of uh, what uh, Ms. Long has already uh, mentioned, um, but to just kind of give you a, a more intimate picture of that. Um, the village of Hatch has a population of approximately 2,000 people with another 2,000 in the surrounding communities that make up the Hatch Valley. The estimated median household income is $28,000 and the percentage of residents living in poverty is 43%. The economic base is agriculture, which include farming, ranching, and dairy. It's easy to see how changes to the production of oil and gas would directly impact our community. Oil and gas are a part of everyday life, including the heating of homes, fuel for personal vehicles, fuel to run farm machinery, and freight and shipping of produce, all have an impact on disposable income. I recently spoke to the local uh, grocery store owner, and I asked him how oil and gas impacted his business through the lens of his customers. And he said, I can always tell when uh, there's an impact to disposable income by the groceries that are purchased. People who, people tend to eat better when they have more disposable income. We have recently seen an increase of, on fuel of 60 cents a gallon in the last two months. That may not be a lot for a lot of people, um, but when the median income, household income is $28,000, not having an extra 10 to $20 a week greatly impacts the quality of life. <clears throat> Besides the agriculture sector, the public schools are the largest employer in the Hatch Valley with 200 employees. Hatch Valley Public Schools has an, uh, an enrollment of 1,200 students with approximately 88% living in poverty, uh, qualifying the district for 100% free and reduced lunch. Still, <clears throat> with all the struggles our students face, they are still the best students in the state of New Mexico. They grow to be very resilient. Oil and gas contributes approximately 34% of New Mexico's budget. In addition, 45% of the state's budget is devoted to education. Again, it's not hard to see the relationship between oil and gas and the impact to public schools budgets. Operating costs increase from heating and cooling school buildings to paying more for fuel to run the buses. In addition, when district budgets are cut, those cuts are felt in the classroom. Most districts look to, look to first make cuts to supplies and materials, resulting in students not having proper learning tools, such as textbooks, computers, and software. Next in line are enrichment programs, such as classes focused on the arts, followed by athletic programs. Most districts in New Mexico devote approximately 85% of their budgets to staffing. And unfortunately, depending on the decrease to school budgets, cuts, cuts in staffing may be needed to maintain operations of school. Cuts to staffing results in increased class sizes and less individual attention to students. The impact on the production of oil and gas is a simple case of cause and effect, which tremendously impacts our public schools. Our students are our future, and it's imperative that we're able to fund a proper education by maintaining appropriate operations of buildings, staffing, enrichment programs, and providing the learning tools students need, that students need. Um, thank you, Chairman Newhouse, members of the caucus, Congresswoman Harrell, uh, for your, your attention and your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Superintendent Chavez. I appreciate that perspective about the educational system. So now is the time in our program where we move into questions. Since I'm, uh, since there is a time constraint on uh, Representative Harrell, I'm going to turn to you first. 
Uh, so please uh, uh, go ahead with your five minutes of questioning and just let me remind everybody to please unmute your microphones when it's time for your response. Great, thank you, Chairman Newhouse. I wanna first address a question to uh, Commissioner Long. Um, Commissioner, you touched a, a little bit on your testimony uh, given Lee County's location along the Texas-New Mexico border. Can you explain the differences between what production looks like in Texas versus New Mexico and what the concerns are uh, with losing some of this economic uh, revenue to the state of Texas? Oh, absolutely. That's uh, an actually a really great question, one that we talk about all the time. The production's the same because the land is, is pretty much the same where we live here. So there's not such a difference in production, but there's a huge difference in regulatory rules. You know, New Mexico's current methane rules actually exceed the national EPA standards. I, I don't know how you, you function in, in a you know, these rules are just proposed right now, but when they exceed the national EPA standards, you know that you're gonna have a hard time. Um, these oil and gas workers live here, their families live here, they choose to live here, and year over year, the emissions have dropped because they care about their communities. These large oil companies and major oil companies, they care about their communities and they want their areas to be clean. You know, they want clean water and clean air for their families. So it's not so much the production that's different, but it's the regulations and rules that are different. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. And, and just to follow up on that, and we're, Lee County is located Hobbs, New Mexico. It literally sits on the border of New Mexico and Texas, just to give kind of a visual of Lee County. And, and there is grave concern that um, because Texas does not have the same public land policies in terms of the, the time it takes to go through the permitting process, et cetera, that, that we could lose those revenues. Um, so I appreciate that perspective. Um, I, I wanna go to uh, Mr. Chavez, and he, and he kind of touched on this in terms of what it looks like for our school districts. And I know, I know, uh, Mike, that your school district is one of our smaller ones, yet very important with over a thousand students. But as these executive orders continue to be signed or you, can, or you start to really see that decline in state uh, revenue opportunities, what, what time frame are you looking at or what will you have to do in terms of making a decision between keeping your buses on schedule for the students versus keeping your, your buildings, your rooms heated. I, and I know right now we've been uh, compounded the problem with the COVID, but I mean, can you, can you kind of explain to us what this looks like, what you're kind of drawing out your matrix for, okay, if we're gonna start seeing our children return to the classroom, what, what kind of options are you going to have to juggle in order to get, in order to make it work with less revenue? Um, thank you, Congressman, Congresswoman uh, Harrell. Um, I, um, uh, as, you, as you're mentioning, as you're going through that, I'm going, it's in my head, I'm thinking about, you know, all the different things that we have to consider. And uh, it's a challenge, um, but with the decreases in, in operational budgets, we have to then look at how can we reduce uh, um, costs. And so everything from utilities on, on, on our buildings, to run our buildings, to operate our buildings, to looking at staffing, uh, and to just kind of give you an idea of that, um, we, just to run the buildings, um, we're gonna have to look at, so how do we reduce uh, utility costs? Well, we may have to um, really shut down our buildings beyond normal operating hours, which means that after school programs, enrichment programs would need to be reconsidered, which then also, not only does that impact the students, but it impacts staff, uh, those staff that depend on those after school jobs. Uh, and so, so then there's a, a decrease in, in, uh, in wages for our, for our staff and then buses, you know, we'd have to look at um, uh, reconsider all of our bus routes and make sure that, um, um, that, that we are running as efficiently as possible. And so many, many different things to consider um, and weigh heavily on, on, on all superintendents across the state of New Mexico. Thank, thank you for that. Um, and Chairman Newhouse, I'll yield back to you for additional questions um, for our other panel guests. Okay, thank you very much, Yvette. And I understand you have to leave us and I fully understand. I appreciate you being part of this this morning. Thank you. And I, I just wanna thank all of the panelists for joining us and for your time and 
clearly we have our work to do, but I look forward to working with our panelists, with our uh, caucus members and, and really protecting our natural resources in the future of our country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, hey Dan, so I, I, I have to leave as well, but I want to thank you before I do uh, that and all, all members of the panel, especially you, uh, Chairman, for your leadership. Very grateful. Thank you, Congressman Stewart. Appreciate your participation as well. Thank you. Um, so let me ask a couple of questions in the few minutes that we have remaining. Um, I, I won't take too much more of your time. I do appreciate you being with us this morning. Um, Mr. McKee, uh, I'm curious if you could speak just a little bit to the mood uh, on the ground in your local communities. I can only imagine, but in Eastern and Central Utah right now, people must be feeling uh, something about the uh, their future, the, the uncertainty, right? Could, could you address that a little bit? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. There, there is a lot of concern. Uh, as I mentioned, when we only have 15% of our land mass uh, within the areas that I'm speaking of. And by the way, our land mass of these seven counties is larger than some states. Uh, but when you only have 15% of that land mass being private land, and these orders affect so much of our economy. Uh, as you know, we've been traditionally, we've had oil, gas, uh, coal, those kind of resources uh, to be able to, to draw on in our communities. And if we have to pull that back, that's, a, that's just a tremendous concern and, and when the economy is no longer there, then what do we do with the jobs? What do, what do we do with families? Uh, do we disrupt families? It's not as though we have you know, another job just sitting there ready to go and here come, come over here and work. This is a total disruption of families. And in many cases, when we have these kind of things happen, uh, families have to move, go to other states. People, these are their homes. This is where they've grown up. This has a tremendous social cost to our communities. And so, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. There, there is a lot of concern in relationship to this. And, and we are so hopeful that something can be done because uh, we have such a tremendous amount of natural resources. And if I could just take that just a second more. Uh, in my area, we have a lot of just really good natural gas, tremendous volumes of natural gas, clean, efficient natural gas. Uh, you know, oil isn't going away. Almost everything... If we look in any one of our rooms, there's an oil product there somewhere just sitting uh, made out of oil and, and those different bases. And in Utah, this oil that we have is very low sulfur. It's some of the lowest sulfur in the world. It's great for low pollution. And, you know, there's going to be these products. And, and so why would we want to limit what we do in our own country, bring it in from another country that doesn't have as good a standards as we have, and uh, it, it makes absolutely no sense. And to give the jobs to other people, our own people, wondering what they're going to do in the disruption of family life. Thank you. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Thank you for those, for those observations. Ms. Long, I'd, I'd like to ask you the, the same kind of a question about members of your community. Are, are uh, uh, folks in Southeast New Mexico uh, feeling the uncertainty? Are they worried? Um, <clears throat> we are extremely worried. Um, I want to, one thing I didn't touch on earlier, I'll, I want to give you a little more information and this will kind of tell you, whenever the Biden campaign, before he was actually elected as president, just when he was talking about putting these moratoriums and canceling oil and gas in all kinds of different ways, it, this already had a huge impact on our county. We were already worried before we even knew, you know, what, who would, who was going to be the, the winner of the election. The majors like Concho, Chevron, EOG, Devon, and Shell, they have already, they had already started changing their outlook for 2021. In 2019, they made a $20 billion investment in the Permian Basin. But in 2021, they're dramatically lowering that. And that dramatic lower lowering is going to go on into 2022 as well. So we are worried. You heard me say that we have 53% of uh, federal lands right here in our county, and it will devastate us. So yes, people are, people are frightened. Mm. 
Um, if you're speaking, I'm sorry. I yeah, follow. I got to follow my own directions, don't I? <laughs> uh, but I appreciate what you're saying. It's similar to some of the comments that Mr. Year was talking about as well. Uh, Mr. Chavez, uh, has there been, or, or can I ask you what communication there may have ha has been coming from the state of New Mexico uh, to leaders uh, in education uh, on ideas on how? Uh, you're going to work to address the significant shortfalls in funding uh, that you are likely to face. Uh, Chairman Newhouse, um, thank you for that question. And I've, uh, unfortunately, to answer that question, um, there has not been a whole lot of talk with uh, school officials or school superintendents at this point. Uh, uh, so much of the attention that uh, we've been involved in has been on uh, reopening of schools and and um, and how to operate schools under the pandemic. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't had that foresight in, to look into the future to see how this is going to impact us. And um, so at this point, um, not that not in the circles that I've been involved in has this been brought up. And so, but it is a big, big concern um, because as I stated earlier, um, <clears throat> when so much of, of the budget is devoted to education, any type of impact that could threaten that and decrease budgets is um, is quite troublesome uh, for all of us and weighs heavily on us because, uh, again, as I mentioned, eighty five percent of, of uh, most school budgets are devoted to staffing. You know, in order to to make budget, um, that's probably the biggest uh, impact that you can do is is to reduce your staffing. But with that, it weighs heavy because you're talking about uh, uh, the the quality of life of, of people. And so um, we're hoping that it doesn't go that far. Well, thank you. Uh, well, the one resource we never have enough of is time. And I've got to uh, take a moment to not only thank Congressman Stewart and Harold, but also to all of you, uh, Mr. Chavez, Mr. Yur, Ms. Long, as well as Mr. McKee. Uh, thank you for uh, speaking on behalf of your communities, of your neighbors. Your, I can't tell you how important your testimony is. And as chairman of the Western Caucus, uh, we want to do all we can to help you lift your voice of, of local communities and, and rural communities throughout this country. Uh, just one final note. Um, unfortunately, it's further bad news. Today and tomorrow on the floor of the House of Representatives, the, the uh, majority party, the Democrats, are moving legislation that will only further uh, pile onto these reckless actions to further lock up lands in the West from responsible energy development. Uh, we're calling this a massive land grab package. It will, it will restrict over a million additional acres of land from critical mineral development and will further lock up another million acres of land under one of the most restrictive land designations we have. Truly, uh, truly unfortunate, uh, misguided, and what we've just heard from you today, wrong for rural communities in the West. Uh, I encourage everyone who's listening and watching uh, today to please tune in to part two of this series. It'll be tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Eastern as we look into the energy and economic impacts of these rec reckless executive orders with, where tomorrow we'll have representatives Liz Cheney of Wyoming, as well as Representative Jody Arrington of the state of Texas, as well as energy experts from their respective states. So I wanna thank everybody for your participation. Thank you for watching and we we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.